Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on differential equations. This is video number 23 and video 4 in the subsection Laplace's equation. Specifically I'm going to discuss the second uniqueness theorem and I'm going to prove it. The previous videos to this are 20 through to 22 and in video number 22 I proved the first uniqueness theorem and in video number 20 I, uh, I introduced Laplace's equation. I showed that you must have no maxima or no, no local maxima or no local minima and in video number 21 I discussed but did not prove Earnshaw's theorem. So th this second uniqueness theorem specifically relates to electromagnetism so if you're looking just to uh, discuss differential equations you can move on to the next video where I, I, st I start solving Laplace's equation. So the second uniqueness theorem is very important for electrostatics or electromagnetism because it relates to the electric potential and the electric potential obeys Laplace's equation. So just to, to I suppose, to, um, to state it, the second uniqueness theorem says that in a volume V surrounding conductors and containing a specified charge density rho, the electric field is uniquely determined if the total charge on each conductor is given. Okay, so if we just remind ourself, ourselves what the first uniqueness theorem said, so in the first uniqueness theorem, we had an arbitrary volume. This is our volume, and what we said, sorry, this is our volume. And what we said was that if we could specify the potential, the potential V on the boundary, then we also knew the potential inside. That's what, it, that's what the first uniqueness theorem said. And if we somehow found a solution to Laplace's equation, which obeyed the boundary conditions, then it was the only solution. So like I said, the first uniqueness theorem is only applied in regions free of charge and surrounded by a boundary of known but not necessarily constant potential. Now in the laboratory, we often give the boundary a particular value of potential, say, say V is equal to zero, which we call ground. But we might instead know the cause of the potential rather than the actual value of the potential. So we might know the the amount of charge which is inside the volume. And what we'd like to know is what, what do we know about the potential as a result. So what we can say is as follows. Let's first of all just, let's just graph, or not graph, I suppose just draw what we're looking at first. So we have an arbitrary volume like this. Here's our arbitrary volume. So the arbitrary volume, let's say we had we have two conductors. You can have as many conductors as you'd like inside your volume. So this is conductor one, which has on it a charge capital Q1. This is conductor two, which has on it a charge of capital Q2. For, I suppose, to be most general, we're going to also say that the space between the conductors inside the volume has a charge density rho. And that what I've drawn in black of course is the boundary. Now where do we go from here? We first of all need to note some of our electromagnetism. So Gauss's law in differential form says that if we take the divergence of our electric field we get the charge density divided by epsilon zero. If we convert that to integral form we get that the closed surface integral of e dot dA is equal to capital Q over epsilon zero, Q enclosed, where the total charge is the volume integral of the charge density, of course. And we also know that the electric field is minus the gradient of the electric potential, which is allowed us, allows us to write the electric potential as uh, Laplace's equation. So that's why what we're gonna do in this particular video is look mainly at the electric field, use a small bit of the potential, but we're able to then infer our results about the potential from just studying mainly the electric field. All right, so in order for us to do this, we're gonna take the same approach as we did in video number 22. We're going to assume that there are two electric fields which, which whose potential satisfy Laplace's equation. So we have electric field one and electric field two are both, they both have potentials which satisfy Laplace's equation. Where do we go from here? 
Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at Gauss's laws. So that means that the divergence of the first electric field is equal to zero, or excuse me, is not equal to zero, is equal to rho over epsilon zero. So it's rho over epsilon zero like this. And the divergence of the second electric field is also equal to rho over epsilon zero. Rho over epsilon zero like this. Now, if we look at Gauss's law in integral form, we're going to have four place, four things we need to do, four integrals. We're going to have to integrate on the surfaces inside the volume or along the surfaces of our conductors. And we also need to integrate along the boundary. So we're going to have a total of four, okay? Because we're talking, to, we need to integrate for each of the electric fields, E1 and E2. So the inside, the, the inside integral is going to look something like this. We're going to have the closed surface integral inside, so along the surface of, of a conductor, is equal to either E1 or E2, dotted with the, uh, excuse me, the surface, uh, infinitesimal surface element, and that's going to be the charge enclosed divided by epsilon zero. So the enclosed charge on that particular surface. So if, say for example, you integrated along the surface of this particular conductor here, you'd get the total charge would be Q sub, Q, Q sub two. So this is along the surface of any conductor. And then we, of course, we have to do two similar integrals, but on the outside, where we integrate E1 and E2 dotted with the infinitesimal surface element. And what we get this time is the total charge over epsilon zero, where the total charge is equal to the sum of the Q sub i's. Now, of course, the next thing I suppose you can see coming is that we look at the potential difference, which is what we did in video 22. But for the moment, we'll just look at the difference in electric fields, which of course will later give us a difference in electric potentials. So we define it as E2 minus E1, and my bio isn't, isn't really behaving. E2 minus E1. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, it means that if we take the divergence of E2, which is Gauss's law in differential form, well, that's just simply going to be the divergence, excuse me, that should be E3. That should be the divergence of E2 minus the divergence of E1. And that's simply going to be rho minus rho over epsilon zero. Or it's going to be zero. So the divergence of E is zero. And that's along every single surface. And something similar happens if we look at the closed surface integral. So this time what we're going to get is that the we're going to get the charge minus the charge over epsilon zero. And one of, of course, that's going to be equal to zero. And this is also along all surfaces. Sorry, this I'll just, I'll just write it specifically now because and after making it an error there, this is along all surfaces. And this is between conductors. Okay, I hope, I, I hope I'm after making myself clear there. Now what do we do? So I'm just going to clear that page. So there is a result from the theory of electromagnetism that conductors must be equal potentials. So the potential must be equal along a conductor, but may differ from conductor to conductor. So if we looked at the potential of conductor two, for example, written in black, let's say the we, we have a certain potential, and if we look at the potential on conductor number one, we'll have a different potential. But along that particular conductor, the potential must be the same. Now, from the product rules for vectors, if we take the divergence of a scalar multiplied by a vector, what we get back is the scalar outside the divergence of the vector. And we have to add to that the vector, take, or take the dot product of the vector and the gradient of the scalar. And I've proven that in my series of videos, Vector Calculus for Electromagnetism. So if we apply that on a very cleverly chosen product, if we apply it on the product of V3, E3, this is a very cleverly chosen product. What we get is 
the following and you will let, I'll let you do a small bit of manipulation only three lines in total and we, and we also need to note that the, the excuse me the gradient of the uh, the potential is equal is equal to the electric field so if you plug that in what we're going to get is that the divergence of the product v3 e3 is going to be equal to v3 outside the divergence of E3 and we need to take away from that E3 to B squared and the reason with E3 to B squared is because we plugged in this particular value here now we saw earlier on we saw earlier on that the divergence of E3 was 0 so if the divergence of E3 is 0 that means we can just remove this particular term and we're left with this equation Now, the divergence theorem says the following, and I also discussed that in my videos going from electromagnetism or vector, cal vector calculus for electromagnetism. So if we take the volume integral of the divergence of a vector, let's say the vector b, and we integrate that d tau, so integrate it along our volume, it's the same as going along a troll surface integral, so that's a surface integral of b dot dA. So it's, it's the same as going along the volume uh, the surface of the volume enclosing. So what we're going to do here is take the volume integral both sides of our equation. So if we take the volume integral both sides of our equation we get the volume integral of the divergence of V3 E3 we integrate that of course d tau along the volume that's going to be minus the volume integral of e3 to b squared integrated d tau but if we apply our divergence theorem to the to the left hand side of our equation we can rewrite the left hand side of the equation as the closed surface integral of v3 times e3 dotted with dA now because I said earlier on that the electric potential is constant across the surface we can take it out of the integral because it's always going to be a constant and what we're left with is this that's a pretty terrible writing but another result we showed earlier on was that if we take the closed surface integral of e dot dA we get zero so what we're left with is that e3 must be zero and if e3 is equal to 0, e1 is equal to e2. And as a result, the potentials are going to be equal also. v1 is equal to v2. So that brings us back to the statement of the second uniqueness theorem that in a volume V, surrounding conductors and containing a specified charge density rho, the electric field is uniquely determined if the total charge in each conductor is given. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the box below.